Welcome to the Westside Barbell Podcast. Today's guest is Brian Bott, and the topic we're trying to go over is how does strength conditioning use or not use the conjugal method in their training? We'll have different segments throughout this episode, but the podcast is going to aim to gain insights into the following areas. Why to become a strength coach? What primary teaching points um, has Brian taken from the Westside Barbell system? And how did he interpret it into his own methods? The role of a college strength coach and what impact do they have on athletic development? And we'll go over his growth as a strength coach throughout the time. And then we'll also discuss the move into the private sector and what challenges and benefits did it bring to him. At the end of the podcast, we hope that you're going to have gained information from a new pers uh, perspective on the why and how someone will become a strength coach and how to learn and interpret training systems to train athletes better. Brian, pleasure to have you here. Tom, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really humbled to be here. This is this is the mecca of strength and conditioning, so I, I, I'm really humbled and honored to be here today. Well, it's our honor to have you here, and you're the first podcast we've actually given an introduction, so hopefully this will, will go well. <laughs> yeah, we'll just roll with it, right? <laughs> um, so I want to start with the question that I think someone who's established as you gets is why become a strength coach? Sure. So, you know, I was a college athlete. I was a, I was really successful high school and college athlete. And I really knew that I wanted to be around athletes in some capacity. And so as I was in college trying to feel my way through everything and understand which realm of coaching I wanted to go into, uh, I, I knew I didn't want to recruit. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to go through that. But I also wanted to impact athletes year round. And strength and conditioning in, in the 90s was, you know, not even close to as developed as it is now. And but there was something that I really got personally from a professional or from a playing standpoint, developing strength as a baseball player, which at that time, too, was just starting to evolve. And I really found um, joy and, and and things like that in doing that. And so really switched my major halfway through. I, I somehow was going into sports management, which I didn't yeah. want to do because I hate wearing pants that have buttons and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, so switched into more of a exercise science um, emphasis, went through, got my undergrad, and then went and did an internship at the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. And that's where I really started to understand the difference between lifting weights, and training athletes and how to train as an athlete. Because at Oshkosh, when I was there, we didn't really have a strength coach, so we we're kind of on our own. So whatever yeah. you could find, you did. And you just kind of went in and you, you lifted and did your thing. I was very fortunate to meet Hal Luther. Hal Luther is the assistant strength coach right now for the Buffalo Bills. Okay. And he was a graduate assistant there, and he really helped me kind of understand where the differences lie with training athletes and stuff like that. So I had a great summer there and then um, really found passion in, in working with athletes in the weight room and on the turf and things like that. So that's where it started. As an athlete, what methods, you said, or what sparse of methods yeah. <laughs> were used to train back then? Oh, man. Um, you know, back then, you know, baseball players, you shouldn't bench press, you shouldn't squat. You know, so it was one of those things where only, we, we only knew as athletes what we were being told. And there was such a lack of knowledge back then on the things that athletes should be doing, even though places like Westside Barbell and other places were, you know, starting to pump out some content. Uh, we never saw any of that. So yeah. it was really just more or less we were bodybuilding. I mean, we were going in there just lifting as much as we could, uh, using dumbbells. Our, our, we weren't allowed to bench with a barbell, which, you know, we've changed that at, at our gyms. Our, our baseball players lift with barbells. But that's where you know it kind of was and it was just hey do leg extensions do leg curls do leg press on, on leg day quote unquote and then you know do dumbbell bench if you can do pull-ups do pull-ups otherwise do lat pulls yeah. and then you know a bunch of bicep curls so you look good and, um but at the end of the day back then it, we were just working that's all we that we didn't know any better we didn't know periodization we didn't know um you know dynamic effort max effort any of that stuff we just knew hey if i could do more than i did last week i'm getting stronger when you were like, you were a pretty accomplished athlete, I think, like in baseball, like it yeah. wasn't as if that you were sitting on the sidelines, not so. Was that a hard transition to go? I'm going to go into the coaching aspect and the athlete aspect. Yeah, I think you know I was very fortunate um, to learn at an early age about the you know being a tough being a tough athlete, how to be tough. Uh, my dad instilled that. Uh, I had you know a high school basketball coach that instilled that, and then Tom Lechner was my college baseball coach instilled that. So 
going into the coaching realm, the, the word toughness was really important to me. And it was really hard to understand because when I was in college, now I can't I can't rival Joe Thomas who played 10,363 snaps in a row in NFL, yeah. but I played every inning of every game for four years. Never missed an inning. D- didn't know any better on that. And so that was the hardest part for me is trying to find out where athletes' level of toughness and competitiveness were in the weight room because it is a competitive environment and you do need a high level of toughness to go in on a daily basis. That was the first thing I had to learn is where to, you know, how to get kids to the level that I thought they needed to be, but also understanding not everybody has that level of toughness or competitiveness. And so you have to learn those things as you go through, as you kind of cut your teeth as a new coach. Yeah. Um, been an athlete that I give an advantage to that. So you could you understood it from the their side as well as the coaching side. Yeah, I think that that's a huge benefit. Now I also always say that you know the best athletes don't make the best coaches. Mm-hmm. You know I was very fortunate that I wasn't the best player on my team. I mean I had Jared Washburn who who pitched for the Anaheim Angels with the World Series. Um, we had the two time National Player of the Year in Division Three, Tim Jorgensen. He hit thirty nine home runs in forty five games. <laughs> which is like yeah. unheard of. So I hit in front of him. So I wasn't allowed to steal. I was like a 6'8", 60 kid, which back then was pretty fast. Now yeah. it's not nothing, but I wasn't even allowed to steal because if I stole, they'd intentionally walk him. <laughs> so I was just really fortunate enough to play around really great players yeah. um, and be a you know what I thought was a good contributor um, to, the, to the program. But I had to work extra hard just to, you know, because I was chasing those guys. And I think that's the beauty of being an athlete is there's always someone that's better out there than you. And as a coach too, there's always someone that may be doing it better than we're doing as as coaches. And to strive to learn and to be at their level is always something that I've always tried to do. I've always tried to look for people who are doing it better than us and learn from them and try and get better ourselves so we can give back. Yeah. Um, what sort of equipment was there back then? <laughs> <laughs> uh well not what we have now that's for sure um you know we had dumbbells uh you know we had some free weights some some of the tiered squat racks yeah. you know what i mean with yeah. different levels and things like that that you would never want to have in your weight room today um quite honestly you know you had the the stations where you had the lat pull station on one side the seated row things like that but you know the equipment that i look at back then is not even close to what people are manufacturing now but it was still stuff that we could get strong using. Yeah. And I think that's one of the main things that coaches need to understand, especially like in the high school realm. You don't need the fanciest equipment. You need stuff that works within your setting. And you know, even though we weren't doing anything ultra high tech, mm-hmm. guys still got strong. They were still able to use stuff and, and go from there. So the equipment was really you know prehistoric, I guess yeah. you could say, but it was still, you, you were able to get better, you know, using it. Do you think that's a problem nowadays that there's too much choice? Yes, absolutely. I think, I think what's happening in today's, you know, high schools, especially Tom, is that they see what the, you know, am I allowed to say college teams on here? Yes. Okay. Um, they see what the Ohio States and like the Wisconsin's and some of these other programs are doing as far as like the expansion and the weight rooms that they're building. And they're like, well, we should do that too. Mm -hmm. No, what you should do in your high school is find people that can coach first and foremost. Invest in people that can coach your athletes the right way to give them the proper coaching. And once you have that and you have momentum in your weight rooms in high school, then find people that wanna throw some money your way to build a bigger weight room to give your good coaches resources to work with. Most high schools do it backwards. and. There's no reason to do it backwards unless you're in a private school where you can actually have kids that are you can recruit to come to your high school. Most kids are, are segmented based on where they live, so they have to go to that high school. So find like good coaches first and then build your elaborate weight room. Don't go backwards because we see it all the time. You build this elaborate weight room, well, we don't know what the hell to do with half this equipment that we bought, you know what I mean? So um, that's one of the biggest problems I see in high schools right now. How would you hire a good coach? Like, what is a good strength coach to you for high school? To me, the first and most important thing is you have to care about kids. You just have to care about their development. You have to care about them personally, first and foremost. 
Um, because if you're just more worried about what you're putting on a sheet of paper and what exercises they're doing, you're missing the whole point of being a coach. Um, the next thing is understand philosophically what they want to do. Um, obviously, we believe in the conjugate method. That's what we use at Sports Advantage, all of our gyms, all of our high schools. Um, get someone that is has a growth mindset, that wants to learn. Uh, I was given great advice one time is hire good people that are motivated to help other people because we can teach them. You know, as long as they're teachable and they want to help other coaches, um, you can teach them the methods if they, you know, if they want to learn. Yeah. Um, I don't think having someone that's set in a philosophy makes the biggest difference, but they still have to have some passion for coaching. And that's, that's I think, the most important. Is there any qualification that you look for or try, if they have it, like to avoid? <laughs> um, you know, for me, obviously having certifications is important, right? I, I think that, you know, there's there's something to, to be said about getting a certification, but that's not for me the, the most important. The most important thing for me is to see like what they did to get to the point they're at right now. Yep. And there's two different tracks that I look at. One, did they go to college for kinesiology, exercise science, things like that? You know, have they, have they invested some of their time into that? The other thing would be like hypothetically, maybe they got a high school and they're just like, you know, I really want to go learn from so-and-so. Mm -hmm. So maybe they come to like Westside for a year and they just like, I'm just going to intern for free and I'm just yep. going to learn. You know, obviously I, I think some of the greatest coaches ever probably didn't have, you know, a college degree yep. and it, they don't need to have a college degree, but they have to have some type of track where they've shown that they're willing to sacrifice uh, their time and learn different things that may make them a better coach. Certifications to me is is nice, but I don't hire based on certifications because to me, quite frankly, anybody can sit down for three hours and take a test. Yep. Um, now, do you have to study for the test? Yes. Do you have to pass the test? Yes. But at the end of the day, like if you just sit for a test, that's not going to be the end all beat all for me hiring you. I want people that care about people and then that have invested in in their knowledge and their growth as a coach. How do you see or have seen the role of interns change in terms of what an actual internship was to what an internship is now? Yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of different um, internships, scenarios, and it's unfortunate because I think in different scenarios, whether it be in team scenarios or whatever, you have a director or a leader that wants to impose that they're better than the interns. Yep. Um, it really frustrates me. I've had guys that work for me that have done internships at different places that they're just like the scrub boy. And the scrub boy to me is the person that cleans the facility, um, you know, adjusts the weights. So all the numbers are on the top, you know, um, things like that. To me, an internship is, you know, it's typically free help or someone that's volunteering. So yes, you're uh, you're getting someone to help you with some of the things that maybe are little tedious tasks and stuff like that. But what we do and what we're building is more of like a class and curriculum for our interns. Mm -hmm. So they actually meet with one of my uh, with Robert on a weekly basis, and we go through like a curriculum, like if we were teaching them, you know, how to be a assistant coach with us or a director with us. So and it's a, a lot of it has to do with educating them on the conjugate method. So we have, you know, one week is just basically how to teach the box squat. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if our interns, if they start in January by April and May can't run the groups, then we fail them because they're giving to us. So we have to give back to them. And I yeah. think a lot of times you know, you use it, a, some people use it as a power trip, which is wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are, are volunteering their times, especially in today's economy, where you have to you have to give them something and not just, you know, the, the name on your resume. Hey, I interned here and I interned here. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. Like, what do you know? What did you learn? Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. And so I think, I, I think some people are starting to get it, but I still think there's that, that imposing, hey, you're just kind of like the scrub boy. And that's what I like to call them, and which is, which is wrong. Yeah. Uh, in that, do you think that there was a filtering process by getting up real early and being able to have that consistency that has 
possibly carried over to make you a better coach? Or do you think that aspect of inter, especially in the, just say in a college football weight room, right. which we'll get into, but those early mornings and late nights, I think test the metal for a lot of people and, but it really assures that you're in the right occupation. Yeah, when that alarm goes off at four o'clock every morning for me, it's there. There, you know, for, for everybody, nobody says that they like getting up extra yeah. early every day. If yeah. you do, you're, you know, you're trying to sell something on social media. You know, when that alarm goes off at four in the morning, um, you have to be ultra passionate to get up, you know, get your stuff done and get, and get there on time. You know, and I think you learn discipline, and discipline is a huge foundation for being a great coach. And so is consistency. And consistency is one of our pillars at Sports Advantage for success. And if you can't consistently repeat that action, and like you said, if you can't consistently stay until the work is done, we don't have time constraints on our guys. You know, you have to be there on time. That's one restraint. You get to leave when the work is done. That's the second one. Yeah. So if we don't have groups, uh, and you can leave at noon, you can leave at noon, as long as what we need get to get done gets done. And I think if you can teach interns and young strength coaches that, uh, it's great because we're past the days of, hey, I gotta be the first one in and I can't leave. You know, I, I come in when it's dark, leave when it's dark. Yeah. You know what I mean? Be efficient with your time. Teach, teach the young people to be efficient versus that time in the middle of the day like if you're working with college athletes or high school athletes, like you have from like eight o'clock until three o'clock where you have nothing but to get done your other tasks for the day. Get them, get them done, you know, get, get your training in then, you know, don't just sit on Instagram for two hours and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll, you know, teach people to be efficient. I think hopefully with internships, especially at the universities, hopefully they're getting better at that versus just having the kids clean the weight room all the time. Yeah. yeah I mean, that, that does nothing. For, for for a young person's development. It helps make the weight room look nice. But if you're really trying to develop interns and put people into the profession, because I always looked at it at like, okay, if this intern goes, like if he was an intern for us at Sports Advantage and he went out and got an assistant job at, at a Wisconsin, I'd be like, you know, we helped that guy in his career. Yeah. And that to me, that only makes your program look better if you're putting people out into the into the profession, good people. And I think if you take a look at it like that, you're going to be more apt to help the kids and, and the interns out. So yeah, you see it as a reflection of you. Absolutely, 100%. You know, if you can put good people out into the profession, uh, to me, that reflects your program. And it's also going to draw more people into you. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, this guy... Um, now is a director at this place, or this guy is an assistant strength coach here. I want to go intern for them because maybe that'll give me the opportunity to do that as well. So if you view it like that, it only helps your program or helps your, you know, your business or, you know, your whatever, wherever you're working. So we've touched on pretty much every area of strength conditioning as, outside of the, um, the professional in the NFL sector. Yeah. From your point of view, where should the most important emphasis on strength conditioning start at? I mean, at the youth level. I mean, that's where you learn. It's a foundation. You know, you have to treat, you have to teach kids how to do things right. Um, and it doesn't always mean walking into the gym and putting a barbell on their back the first day or putting, putting a, you know, a barbell in their hands to bench. Um, I get it all the time, Tom, is people come to me and they're like, why, why, why do you want to be a strength coach? That's always my first question. You know, because sometimes I think we're all kind of crazy for doing this. You know what I mean? And a lot of times I get, well, I want to work with college and pro athletes. Well, those guys are already pretty developed. And they're, you know, especially the pro athletes, they know what they want. You know, I have, you know, guys that I train and, you know, they could train themselves pretty much because they know exactly what they need, what they want. We've taught them a good job with the systems. Um, they have us around, obviously, if we have to make changes for them. But that that seventh and eighth grade high school, I mean, if you can if you can really put great teachers and, and coaches with those kids, once you teach a foundational movement and they have it ingrained in them, it's really hard to to screw it up, mm -hmm. you know. As long as you teach it right, but if you teach it like like crap, I mean, then all of a sudden now you're breaking bad habits, and so that is where we need our best teachers and our best coaches, and that's where you can make the most impact because coaching is making an impact on other people's lives. Coaching isn't about us. It's about the athletes mm -hmm. and, and the people that we affect and that we, that we teach. And so if you can have great people in that seventh and eighth grade, you know, even sixth grade, 
uh, in high school levels and be great teachers, that's where you're going to make the most impact because you can start to develop them. And they're going through growth spurts, which, you know, is an easy way to get, you know, their numbers to go up because yeah. they're growing and they're getting stronger. And so having really great teachers at that level, that to me is the most important. And to me, that's the, the area I enjoy the most because you impact their lives in different ways than what their parents do or their sport coaches mm -hmm. do. And that's where you can develop really great relationships with kids as well. So to me, that is the most important. Anybody, everybody wants to work with, you know, the pro athletes and things like that. But if you want to make a real big impact, that's the, those ages are, are the most important. Do you and have your staff view the kids you train the same way as you have an intern in that it's a reflection of you and you want to give them skills and teach them goal setting? 100%. Um, if you watch our social media, and we talked about this a little bit, we show exactly what we do on our social media. We're not a, a picture print you know, organization. Yeah. You're going to see what we do at, at all of our locations. And the best part about our locations is that if you look at our Sports Advantage Beaver Dam and you look at Sports Advantage Wanakee, Verona, Oconomowoc and some of the other ones we have coming out. If we're looking at a max effort day, the, all four of them are going to be different. Yeah. Because what we do is we teach our coaches that the kids that are in your gym are going to have different needs than the kids at a different gym. And so the same philosophies and the same foundation of the conjugate method uh, are utilized in all of our gyms and all of our high schools. But we take it a step further. It's not just copy and paste. So we're not a we're not a chain, things like that. It's every director has to have a incredibly high knowledge mm -hmm. of the conjugate method, how to program it, how to make adjustments, which I think is the most overlooked part of the method. And when you watch it, you see differences. And so when we have kids that are doing different things, we take a lot of pride in how our kids look when they train. Mm -hmm because that's a reflection of us. And there's been many times where I've, or, or you know, one of our other coaches is like, hey, that doesn't look right when we take it down. You know, because at the end of the day, let, let's be realistic, in every gym, in, in any gym in the world, there's gonna be some times where technique doesn't look the way it's supposed yeah. to look. You, you just can't, you know, it's just, it's gonna, gonna happen. And so that's where a good coach understands that and coaches the kids through it and, and makes the corrections. but we're very diligent of what we show because it's a reflection of us as people and coaches. And like I said, parents are giving us their most prized possession. A, a young athlete is a parent's and a family's most prized possession. We take that responsibility very seriously when they walk in the door every day, no matter if it's the warm up, uh, if it's their mobility, activation, prehab, rehab, whatever it is, you know, jumping, squatting, deadlifting, anything. We take that very serious. And so the technique that you see from our, our programs is I think at a very high level, we take a lot of pride and our kids take pride in that mm -hmm. too. You know, cause they, the kids see social media and they see other stuff yeah. and they're, we educate our kids. Like our kids understand the conjugate method as they get older, they ask questions. And so we educate them, we want them to know. Um, and, and so they understand what, sh what it should look like and what it shouldn't and what pride and where you train is. And we have a lot of kids that take a lot of pride in their training with us. Have you seen your kids be more assets in a college weight room that started with you compared to others? Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, I just went to a, a, a Big Ten university to visit. We had two kids that, that trained there. And from the head football coach, the head strength coach, um, really had incredibly positive stuff to say about the two kids that trained with us in our Sports Advantage Wanakee location, that they were prepped, ready to go, knew how to follow directions, uh, knew the tempo, because again, going from high school to college, there's a different tempo. Um, there's also the anxiety of being around, you know, guys that are four years older that are grown men and you're 18 yeah. years old. And, and so we get that a lot. We get some kids that, you know, went to UW that have trained with us. Um, and we get a lot of positive feedback. Hey, they technically they're very sound. They take coaching, which to me, going from high school to college is the most important thing. Can you take coaching? Because typically if you're playing college football at the division one level, any college sport, you're probably one of the best two players on your team in your school. Yeah. So 
if you can take coaching, then when you go to that next level, it shows that you're able to understand that, hey, I have growth to do. And I think that's a really important message for high school kids to learn. But yeah, we get a lot of positive feedback on our kids when they go to college because they're taught right. So the way you've taught them, they go into a college weight room. Do they know what's going to work, what's not going to work, and how to adjust to that situation so they don't get hurt? Um, I think that becomes a really fine line, right? Especially as a freshman when you walk in the door. Um, and there's every college scenario has a different style of training. And so not everybody box squats in college. They should, but not everybody yeah. does. Um, so when our kids go, you know, we educate them on how to ask questions. Yeah. So you don't want to, like as a high school senior going in to be a freshman in college, you don't want to walk into your strength coach's office or your position coach's office and be like, hey, I didn't do this in my high school. This, you know, this works for me. This works, you know, you got to be smart about it and, and ask the right questions. Hey, coach. Uh, you know, when I was training at, at Sports Advantage, you know, we used to do this. You know, I had a lot of good success. You know, can you, you know, just explain the philosophy? And, and, you know, a good strength coach in college will take that as a as an athlete that wants to learn, not as yeah. someone that's trying to like, I don't believe in what you do, yeah. you know. Um, and so I, we, we educate our kids on that, too, because there's a lot of different ways to do the right thing and ask the right questions and also to understand their bodies, you know, if something's not feeling right, to make sure that they express that. And if, you know, if they need more, you know, if they feel like, hey, I, I can do more, to just say, hey, coach, you know, I think I can be pushed harder. You know, and there's ways to say that. But we advocate for our kids to, to hey, ask questions, be smart. You know, you guys are educated enough when you leave. Um, you know it works, things like that. And unfortunately, sometimes the kids come back and, you know, they, you know, especially as freshmen, because yeah. they're in a, a learning and a mm -hmm. teaching environment. So maybe they do regress a little bit. Yeah. But it's not because of maybe what they're doing. It's maybe they're just being taught a different thing and they, they have to kind of reprogram some things. When uh, your kids get accepted to uh, a college, yeah. like that's a very big day in anyone's life. Yeah. Do you do background work or your staff do background work into the system they're going into to and try educate them, hey, this is what you're going into. This is what to be aware of. 100%. Uh, I even go as far as emailing or calling the strength coach and just be like, hey, I introduce myself to them. And I say, this is this is what we use. This is how they've been trained. And 100% of the time, this is 100% of the time, the coaches say, keep doing what they're doing. Just keep doing what they're doing. Whatever changes we need to make, we'll make them when they get here. Because obviously for if they've been training with us for six years, two years, you know, one year, whatever, yeah. something's worked to get them to that point. Or we've, you know, I don't ever say that we're the end all beat all and we're the only reason kids get recruited. I hear that a lot and I think it's a joke. There's mm -hmm. so many different reasons why kids get recruited. Uh, we're part of that. And I want to be a proactive part for our athlete to make sure that it doesn't appear like they're being standoffish. Hey, coach, what are, are there things that you want me to add in? Um, I always 100%. We don't we don't do Olympic lifts at our gyms for a lot of different reasons, and I tell the coaches, hey, if you're doing Olympic lifts, you know, I feel like I can teach them because I did when I was at Wisconsin for a while, but we don't do that here, and I would rather have them learn under your guidance yeah. versus me teaching it the way that I teach it, because again. Everybody has different coaching cues and mm -hmm. things like that. So we're ultra proactive. And to the college strength coaches' credit, they're always like, keep doing what they're doing. Whatever they're doing is working. There's a reason why we want them. And, and the strength and conditioning that you're doing with them is part of the reason. Before we circle back in to your business, um, your interpretation of the system and yeah. all that, can we talk about a college strength coach? Sure since that was a good chunk of yeah <laughs> of your foundational input into becoming who you were um you worked as a strength conditioning coach for north dakota um moved to madison wisconsin to work with the badgers um spent three or 13 seasons there yeah what was that move like initially going from where you started to going sure so when I went to the University of North Dakota, I went as a grad assistant. I worked with Paul Chapman for two years. And that was an awesome, awesome experience. 
you know, to be a college strength coach because, you know, when we drove there the first time, you, know, you get to Fargo and you're like, oh, this isn't bad. And then you're like, you got to go 70 miles straight north. Okay. And so you get to UND and, you know, it was at the time it was a division two level school, except for we had division one hockey and they were a powerhouse in hockey, yeah. really good football program. Uh, I was a, allowed to work with and program. You, you're thrown right into the gate or, or right into the fire, you know, day one. So I had the volleyball team. I had the men's basketball team. I had baseball. I had swimming and diving uh, and also helped out with, with track and field yeah. and uh, with football. You know, you, everybody's involved in football and I was able to help out with hockey. So you're like, you know, kind of thrown into the mix yeah. and, and, and whatnot. And then you also had to go to school. So, you know, we talked earlier about learning discipline and being consistent. Well, you know, the football lifts for the freshmen were at 6 a.m. So you did that. And then I had like my, my divers and some of my swimmers at like 7.30. And then you had off or I had to go to school, you know, take classes. And you also had to teach a class, which was really weird. <laughs> um, and then at 1 o'clock, football started. So you had from 1, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, we had football. And then we dispersed. You know, the other GA and myself dispersed to our team. So then I had men's basketball and then I had baseball and then I had women's volleyball and you were kind of rotating through. And then you went to class until 10 o'clock at night, you know, grad classes for like three or four nights a week. Um, and so that really taught how to work, how to manage your time, uh, start to learn, you know, how to program athletes, um, how to deal with things that maybe you didn't know how to deal with uh, because you were kind of just thrown in the fire. And it was, yeah. a it was, it was awesome. I loved my time at UND. Um, and then... You know, being from Wisconsin, I had always wanted to work at Wisconsin. Uh, I went and visited a couple times uh, when John Detman was the strength coach just to kind of see what it was all about. And I kept sending resumes and sending resumes and sending resumes uh, for like three or four years, even when I was at UW Oshkosh. Um, anytime I was at North Dakota and I would pick up a new team or switch positions, I would send them a resume. And so after the 2000 Rose Bowl, which was Ron Dane's last game against Stanford, it was probably April. He actually called me, which is really weird. And he said, my, my top assistant is leaving. Uh, I have a position open. And uh, I usually go through all the resumes of people that um, have sent me resumes. And half of them are, are, are yours. <laughs> he goes, so obviously you want to work here. And I'm like, yeah, I do. And he said, well, I'm doing interviews this next week. And I said, this was like a, a, a Thursday. I said, no, I'll get in my car on, on, at like 4 o'clock. And I'll be there, and that's like an eight-hour drive. And so I literally got in my car, threw together like a suit coat and jacket and tie, and showed up for the interview. And um, I ended up getting the job. And so that that was something that I had always really wanted because being from Wisconsin, I take a lot of pride in things that happen in Wisconsin. And I was just really, really honored and blessed just to get a call. Yeah. And when I got the call, I was like, no, no, no way, am I not gonna go go get this job? Yeah. So that's how that started. Was that a pivotal moment in your career? Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it gave me the opportunity to um, go in and learn in a, in a very successful program, understand what strength and conditioning was evolving to, because at that time it was really starting to evolve uh, into what it is today. And, you know, a lot of the people that I still have contacts with are people that I met at Wisconsin. And so it was a huge, huge opportunity in my career. But I would say that I made the most of it. You know, I got the most out of my 13 years there for sure. How did your time at uh, North Dakota prepare you for Wisconsin? Just like I said, I, I think learning how to work because, you know, you're at a, at a D2 school, um, you know, a little smaller school, things like that. But when you get to when you when I got to Wisconsin, it was like another level up as far as like the expectations, yeah. as far as like making sure that the weight room was set. You know, when we started, if there was things out of line, understanding that, you know, shit runs downhill, right? If the head coach isn't happy, you know, typically then it goes to the position coach. Well, if the position coach isn't happy, well, it goes on in the weight room. You know what I mean? And it kind of, that's the way, that's the way that, you know, college sports works. And so we learned, you know, I learned right away that you got to have all your I's dotted and T's crossed. Um, and so that really formed a lot of great habits for me uh, as I went through my career. One thing that I think a lot of people don't understand, especially those not in strength conditioning and who watch football from the stands, 
from your point of view, can you explain or describe the physical demands placed upon a football player at the collegiate level? Oh, man. Well, I mean, when I was there, you know, you, we still had two-a-days. So, like, our first couple years, you know, you'd have a practice Monday a.m., Monday p.m. They'd both be full pads. And then you go Tuesday a.m., full pads. And then Tuesday afternoon, half pack, which is like helmets and shoulder pads. Then Wednesday, we would go scrimmage. And then Wednesday afternoon, you'd go do a walkthrough. Thursday, you know, maybe if the scrimmage went well, you'd have like half pads. Thursday afternoon, half pack. Friday morning, you'd do full pad. Uh, Friday afternoon would be what we call spiders or like little foam fake shoulder mm-hmm. pads. And then Saturday, you'd have another scrimmage. So just imagine like two and a half hours and full pads, you know, twice a day, you know, three or four times a week. Um, the demands on these guys are incredible. And when you start, to, when you get into the season, you know, you're talking about you got to train, you got to go to school, you, you have practices. It, it's, you know, unmatched the demands, you know, from any anything you can really explain because it's just constant. You're constantly going and you constantly have to be somewhere else. And the mental um, stress that these guys go, go through is just as, as hard as the physical stress, mm-hmm. you know, trying to prepare. Um, you know, I remember there were nights when I was there when in, in 2010, 11, and 12 when, when I was in charge of the offensive line uh, and a couple other position groups that I would actually, you know, after dinner, go and sit with them in the film room on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights. And I had my own my own personal Norma Tech that I would just sit there while each guy's rotated through the Norma Tech to try and help them recover. Yeah, because the, the demands were so hard, but they had to watch film for you know they would go and watch film for two or three hours at seven o'clock at night, and so what people don't understand, and when they watch college football, it's funny to you know why are we calling this play? Why are we doing this? Well, because we've studied for a hundred hours, and the coaches have looked at that portion of this play we think will work, and what they don't realize is that the other team is doing the same thing, and how can we counteract it? Um, and so the demands that go on the players kind of go back to that is in my opinion unmatched you know now they've gotten better the nca has gotten better with that trying to you know moderate some of that stuff and you know rightfully so because i think sometimes things went way too far as far okay we'll run it again run it again well we've been out here for three hours and it's 90 degrees no run it again until we get it right well, those days are gone yeah. in college football you know what i mean you just can't do it anymore so I think it's gotten better, and I think, you know, a lot of the programs have done a better job with understanding the value of nutrition, mm-hmm. the value of the recovery modules that, that uh, hundreds of different recovery modules that these kids need. Um, so I think it's gotten better to help manage it, but I don't even know how you could put like a number, like a one to ten, yeah. how intense it is, because practices get really intense, you know, and they're physical. So, yeah. From when you started to when you finish, how did your perception of your job and how you trained your athletes evolve? Ooh. <laughs> There's a lot in that, I know. There's a lot in that. Um, so when I started, you know, I really, as a young coach and a new coach, right, you you want to impress your boss. Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And so you're always doing exactly what you're told. You're always, you know, early, and I, will, I am, I, I still, it drives me nuts like when, when I fly with my wife because she'll get to the airport at the last possible minute and I want to be there two and a half hours early. You know what I mean? Because it's just ingrained in me. Um, I think a really pivotal moment for me in my career was uh, Barry Alvarez's last game. We were playing Auburn and we were decimated on the defensive line and we had to have Joe Thomas play D-line for us and because he was such a great athlete. Well, he's also you know the best left tackle to ever play the game. Um, and he, that was his junior year. And I mean, he, you know, in all reality, he probably was going to leave for the NFL draft. And so there was a play that he was kind of on the back end. He was chasing the play and he was running and went to, you know, slow down and decelerating ACL tour. And so I'm sitting there like one, okay, this guy just lost millions of dollars. Two, at, to that point, that guy pound for pound was the best athlete I had ever seen. Why did this happen? And that was like an enlightening moment for me of to start thinking like, well, wait a minute. Maybe there are other, are other things that we could be doing. Mm-hmm. Maybe there are other things 
that would work outside of just the strict regimented things that we've done for uh, you know quite some time. And so that moment really shaped my career as a coach because then I started venturing out on my own. I started watching more stuff on Westside Barbell. I started watching um, more videos and, and clips of different places and how they do things and start wondering, okay, for my own personal want, right? Are there things that we could do better? And I started bringing some other things to the table of like, hey, have we ever thought about doing this? And, you know, and exploring some different things. And I think it helped the program. I think it was something that, you know, from an injury prevention standpoint, is all that's the most important thing that we do as a college coach. Um, your job is to keep the kids on the field as long as you can. You know, big, big squats and big benches are great. And they also aid in that progression. But your job is to keep kids on the court, on the field. And so that was something that I, I really dove into. Are there other things that we can do? And um, I think it really bettered my career. So unfortunately, you know, and I, Joe and I laugh about this because Joe's my business partner, you know, and every time that we do an event or something, I always tell, you know, that's kind of the changed my career, you know, unfortunate, but it, it really did. I, things turned out pretty okay for him in the end. Not bad. Yeah, yeah he did all right. <laughs> yeah, he did all right. No, but I think then moving forward on that, Tom, after that, you know, we had a change in leadership as a as strength coach, and 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 Ben Herbert, who's now the strength coach at in Michigan, took over, and you know there there was a a time where he was just like, there are some things that you can bring to the table, you know, that I want you to be able to do, and you know he knew that I had a lot of passion for the university for our kids, and he you know he gave me some very unique responsibilities that you don't see in college football. I mean, mm -hmm. if you would have walked into our rate room, you'd, you'd have thought there were two head strength and conditioning coaches. You know, Rob Havenstein still, Havenstein, I, sorry, Rob. Rob uh, still, uh, you know, talks about me as his head strength coach. You know, so it was a really unique situation because he allowed me to program the offensive line, the tight ends, the fullbacks, and the quarterbacks however I wanted. It's amazing. However I wanted. You know, he would ask me, I would tell him, he's like, all good. You know, and for me, it became one of those things where, okay, and, you know, I'm going to say this, and I don't really care what anybody else says. Wisconsin's O-line U. Wisconsin is O-line U, right? That is where, you know, I believe that is the bread and butter of that, that university, and people can argue and, and things like that. So now I've just been handed the, what is the quote-unquote top position view, you know, in the program to handle and i'm like oh boy <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. now now i got to make sure everything is sound and fundamental and and but it was also one of those things where it allowed me to be me um and do things that that i wanted to do be the person and coach you know i felt almost i don't want to say that chains were on you because that's not fair um but it was one of those things where it's kind of like the one of those i believe in you and i know you're going to do the right thing and so that was, you know, and we went to three Rose Bowls and we had like, I don't know how many of the guys got drafted, you know, but I think we had a little something to do with it. What did you learn from Ben Herbert? Um, ben was such a great leader. He had a pulse of the team. And he also is really good at putting people in the right place, getting the people, you know, the right guys on the right and the right seat on the bus. Mm -hmm. And he was a very honest, open communicator. You know, if he had an issue or with something, we could sit down and talk about it. And, you know, I owe a lot to my career to him because he gave me the opportunity, you know, to, I don't want to say be out in front and center, but, you know, allowed me to be, you know, integral mm -hmm. in, in the program instead of a lot of times, you know, in college programs, you see the head strength coach gets all the notoriety. And the four or five guys that are the assistants, you know, they're the assistants. Well, you know, he he gave me the opportunity to do that. He also gave me the opportunity to grow on my own, you know, and have conversations with him. And I think, you know, some of the things that we did, you know, in the initial, you know, year or two with the O-line, I think that helped him become a better strength coach too. And at the end of the day, I mean, what they're doing, you know, in that, I guess I have to say the place up north, right? Is that how we say that in Ohio? Um you know, I think they're doing good things there. And so I, I owe a lot to Ben Herbert. He's still a good friend of mine. We text um, regularly. 
Um, and I just, you know, I just appreciate the opportunity he gave me. That's a rare thing to hear. Yes. What was that conversation like? So Ben comes in, <laughs> you guys said like, from like, were you trying to go this camp? There's something odd with this conversation. <laughs> so, I mean, total transparency. It was a Thursday morning and, um, you know, he had some uh, some strongman stuff he was doing on the on the turf of the D line, and he was like, "Hey, um, you know, coach, want coach? I won't I, you won't use the coach's name. He's the O line coach. Um, wants wants O line squatting twice a week. He goes, so you're gonna take him today? <laughs> like 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 in a half hour? <laughs> and he goes, he goes, yeah. He goes, we got to we got to do this. He goes, and he wanted him Olympic lifting too, which. You know, I think Olympic lifting is can be a, a, a good asset when taught properly. Um, and so those are kind of my two tasks. And so I said, okay, well, you know, they back squatted on Monday. Well, we're going to front squat. And so that was just the easiest transition for me. And we were heading into spring ball. And so spring ball to me was always train through spring ball. We need to train through spring ball. And we are kind of getting to that point, but not totally. And I was like, we got three days to train in spring ball because we practiced Tuesday, Thursday, Fr Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And we trained Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So you could still get a lot out of the guys if you mm -hmm. constructed things right. And so I'm like, well, you know, I've got one shot at this. I'm either going to, they're either going to fucking hate me or they're going to love me in this. And so I'll never forget, it was probably about four weeks into this. And it was a Friday afternoon and it was spring. The spring ball games are typically a joke. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're kind of the first show. Um, they're great to get the fans there and stuff like that. So the real, the real spring game, what we would call it is the week before. And we were coming up on that scrimmage where there's no fans, but you know, coach Bielema was always like with, you know, coach Chris and coach Dorn and coach Ash. They're just like, Hey, Practice them as long as you want. Are you good? Are you, and Coach Chris would be like, well, if I get to coach ball, we're going to be out here until <laughs> I'm, you know. And so the guys knew that. And so the week before, you know, what I, what I thought was a very dominating performance up front for us um, went really well. And so it was a shorter scrimmage, but we front squatted on that Friday. And we were, like, doing heavy doubles, like eight or nine sets. And so we come back the next week. You know, I got – you know, the one transition I did make is we listened to like 80s and 90s heavy metal <laughs> rock. I didn't, I, I'm not a big hip hop guy in the weight room when guys are squatting. And so, you know, we're doing it again, you know, and I'm pushing guys, you know, I want them to PR, you know, it was always important to improve. And, you know, I could see a little bit of, it's like set four, set five, you could see the frustration set again. Turn the music off. So what's the problem? You know, I said, I, I, what is the problem here right now? Well, we got this, and I can't believe we're doing, you know, this. And, like, some of the guys that were the seniors that were, they were buying in, but they were like, you know, why are we doing this right now? We got a scrimmage. I said, look, guys, here's the deal. I said, this year, this was 2010, I said, on October 16th, Ohio State's coming to town. And at that time, they were the number one team in the country. They're going to have a 20-game win streak. I said, we have to beat them. I said, so if you look at last week, we just beat Ohio State. I said, you don't get a week off during the season. Next week, we have to go to Kinnick Stadium, play Iowa. At the time, they had four guys on their D-line. Adrian Claiborne was one of them. Klug was another one. All four of them played in the NFL. And the year before, they knocked us around pretty good. I said, so you don't get weeks off. I said, so if you, know, if you want to take a week off, go ahead. Go, go in the shower, go form roll, do whatever you want. I said, otherwise, set sixes up. And I cranked the music, and they squatted, uh, and they got after it. They got in the field. Um, the next day, ran a ball. I thought we, you know, dominated up front. And that was the turning point. They started to understand, okay, so he's got some method behind the madness. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we don't have weeks off right now. We don't have, we can't take a week off because we want to outplay our RD line, the guys that we're going to lock arms with. Yeah, Like, you got you to gotta learn how to fight through it. I said, because during, during the season, like, you guys will be stronger in November than you were in July. I said, I'll promise you that because I already knew how I wanted to run the in season different than what we had done before. And I said, you have to learn how to train in season. So like if you go out and play bad in, in a spring ball game, nobody cares. 
you know, you're going to get coached hard. You're going to get you, but you know, that doesn't show up as an L in the, in the column, you know, during mm -hmm. the season. So that was a huge turning point for us. How important is developing culture compared to strength training? I think you have to have both. And I think they're intertwined. Um, I think more so than fake energy in the weight room, you have to have your kids believe in what you're doing. And so that comes through education. That comes through you showing how much you believe in what you're doing. And it also then comes down to proving it. So you have to get results. You know, anybody can run around on the field and, and you know, jump around and go crazy and things like that. And I was, you know, I, I would do that sometimes, like when we would squat. I remember throwing a 32-ounce Powerade, full Powerade, into our training room window, just smashed on the window. Yeah. And we had high school coaches there and everything. And I think there's a time for that, but I think creating a real culture is really hard to do. I think it's, it's something that is fostered on a daily basis. And it's something that is a, there, there's no gray area when you're building a culture. This is the way it's gonna be done. And we have a, a saying on our wall says the standard is the standard. And if it doesn't live up to the standard, your culture gets cracks in it. Just like your strength program, mm -hmm. right? If you, don't, if you don't consistently mandate your kids squat a certain way, box squat a certain way, which is the only certain way to squat is correctly, <laughs> right? The only way to bench press is correctly. The only way to deadlift is correctly. Same thing, the only way to do you know, an RDL is correctly. So you have to coach every single exercise with the same intensity, with the same intent. Because if you just let your guys or female athletes, you know, get on a, on a max effort day, you know, hit a PR, and then you kind of take the next 45 minutes off, well, you know, 80% of the work is done in those auxiliaries that nobody really sees. And so that's how you create a culture. You value everything and you, you, you have to prove it with results. You have to get results. And if you're not getting results, you have to be the first one to change. Because at the end of the day, like the kids are gonna keep coming in and doing what you tell them to do for the most part. But if you don't change, all of a sudden you start creating kinks in your armor. And what you did in, what we did in 2010, there's no freaking way I would do that again. Yeah. Because I've learned so much. You know, philosophically, foundationally, everything's the same. But exercise selection, timing of exercise would be completely different. So you, a great football culture, a great sports team, I shouldn't just say football, a great sports team culture to me is built in the weight room, but it can also be crumbled in the weight room. Kind of to carry on from that, and this is from a point of not understanding the why, yep. is it fair that the strength conditioning coaches job and job security is attached to the head coach or to the sports coaches and is there a reason that it is i think it's become that because i think head i think it's the uh, to me it's the fault of the head coach because they value the strength and conditioning program so much and i just know that you know just watching some of the hires over this past year i mean the first guy they hire is a strength coach or the two coordinators. So you're, I think in college athletics, there's putting more of a premium on the strength coach because they're with the guys more. You know, I heard a stat from um, the new staff at, at Wisconsin that I think their strength coach touched the athletes in some capacity like 280 times in a year. That's 80% of the days of a year you see that strength and conditioning staff. So... Is it fair? I think it is fair to a certain extent. But if you start just looking at wins and losses, I think that's where we get into that mucky region. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Saturday afternoon, you know, your job as a strength coach is to keep everyone off the, off the field, right? You're the get back coach. You're not calling plays. You're not making substitutions. You're not doing that in the game time, you know, perspective. Conversely, you could also argue that the head coach's job is tied to the job the strength and conditioning staff does because if you have a 15 to 20% injury rate on your staff or you have 10 to 12, not staff, but on your team, mm -hmm. or 10 to 12 hamstring strains, and now 
you're talking about your second or third guy playing versus your you know five star recruit or the guy that you had started playing. Well, now where does the blame fall in that? So I think you got to be careful with that. But I think that's the reality of the world we live in. And I think where we start to look at like injury prevention, you see it all the time at camp. Like if you get one injury, typically you start to see a position group get decimated because like if you have an injury to a guy who's on your ones, like your top receiver, well, now you moved your second, you know, your number two receiver up. Well, he's not used to getting that many reps. So now he starts to wear down. And now another guy wears down. And then maybe you got a guy who's a little softer and he sees everybody else getting hurt. He pulls himself out. Now you got freshmen and now now the coaches can't even run the, the schemes they want because guys don't know the plays as well. So it's it's a revolving door. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, if you're gonna bring a you know, a basketball only or a football only staff in, I think everybody is gonna be tied to the success of the program. And I think that's just kind of where we've gone, mm-hmm. you know, in strength and conditioning. How important is that feedback loop of information between um, sports specific staff and strength staff? I think it's I think it's integral. Um, I'm not a sports specific strength coach. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in it. Um, anybody that wants to message me and argue with that, more than welcome to because I train uh, guys to become better athletes. I train females to become better athletes. And Just what? To, sorry, to clarify, I meant by sports. Uh, by position coaches, by the skill coaches. Yep, yep, so, I was, yep, right exactly. So now you start having those conversations of, okay, here's where so and so was at the beginning of the winter. Here's where he is now. Um, now we have to sit down and look at spring ball. Okay, how many reps is he going to get? Um, how how integrated is he going to be? You know, can we put him on a four day program versus a two or three day program? Um, and then the other thing you have to deal with in you know, especially the football scenario is you get into week like three or four in the winter, all of a sudden now coaches can be involved in workouts. So now you start taking away some of the stuff that you're able to do as a strength coach because the football coaches want, you know, their guys running routes or they want them doing one-on-ones or things like that. It's not padded, but you really have to balance the, the volume of work if you want to get the results. So I think, unfortunately, a lot of times this, the strength staff kind of gets put a little bit on the back burner because there's such a football orientated want mm-hmm. that you start putting them on the field and now they're doing more running, change of direction stuff than maybe we would even program. But you're kind of at the mercy of the head coach. If he wants to do that, you're doing it. Mm-hmm. And so having those communications, like you said in the question, is integral. Like you have to have, I know for me, I would talk to our O-line coach, O-coordinator and uh, tight ends coach. The O-coordinator was a quarterback's coach every day. I would go up there every day uh, and tell them exactly who did what, how they did, um, where I see something that they may want to watch for on the practice field because it's a little dinged up. Because at the end of the day, if I can't help them do their job, they're not going to be able to help me do mine. Mm-hmm. And so that communication is integral. And you have to get past the hard conversations because when the worst conversations to have are on Sunday morning after you get beat because everybody is looking for reasons why you get beat, and you have, but you still have to have them. And you still have to get the point of view of the coaches of what they're seeing on film because I couldn't – like I could watch film, but I, like, I don't know, so, so it's yeah. supposed to down block or whatever. But you get an impression of, hey, he looks like he's getting off the ball late. Hey, it looks like when he's pulling, it looks like he, you know, he's limping a little bit. So those conversations are integral. And I think a lot of coaches shy away from it because they don't want to have the hard conversations. The only conversations that get you anywhere are the hard conversations. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot to it. Oh. Like there's there's a lot in every aspect of working with a collegiate team. Yes. Does that escalate? by the success of the team, the more successful the team becomes, the more pressure builds up in the back end. No question, you know, but I, I think Rex Ryan, you know, had a, had a great quote, like you want expectations to be high. Yeah. If you, if you're walking in the door and you're just hoping to make a bowl game or you're just hoping to have a winning record, uh, you know, you don't want to, I, I don't, I know this. I don't know if I would want to work in that scenario. I want to work with a team that, you know, every Saturday the game matters. And so, yes, the pressure becomes greater and greater. And 
what I'm seeing for a, from a trend, this is just for me being in it and now out of it, is when you look at the NFL, and we all joke that the NFL is not for long, right? You know, you, you're only, you're holding the job of the mm -hmm. person that's going to replace you, really, is what coaches joke about. You know, they're getting rid of coaches after one, two, three years. Well, you know, college football seems to follow what the NFL does. Now you're starting to see these contracts grow and grow and grow. Now the pressure to win increases immediately, mm -hmm. right? There's there's not a lot of, hey, we want to rebuild. No, we want you to win next year. And so I think that pressure then trickles downhill, like we yeah. talked about before. And so if guys aren't getting stronger, if they're not getting faster, you better have some data points um, as to why they aren't, you know. And so that pressure is extremely high. And, you know, you get a guy that pulls a hamstring in a workout or twists an ankle in a workout, you know, that walk up to the position coach's office yeah. sucks because you're like, um, you know, we were doing this and, you know, and it's never a good conversation, but you have to have it. You know yeah. what I mean? And so, yeah. Did you ever think we would be in a scenario where a head strength coach is making half a million to a million dollars a year? No, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, but I'm very happy for them. Mm -hmm. They deserve it. You know, they deserve to be paid like a coordinator because, you know, I, I know in, in, in one program, you know, the strength coach basically was in charge of the team for half the year, you know, in the off season. They yeah. ran the team meetings. They do this. And I and I go back to Herbs. You know, I, I, he does a lot of that stuff. You know, those guys deserve to get paid. And I would advocate their assistants need to get paid. Mm -hmm. Their assistants need to get paid like position coaches because – they're there as much as the head strength coaches. You know, the assistants aren't able to take more time off and things like that. And they have a lot of responsibilities as far as position groups that they're they're in charge of. You know, a lot of a lot of coaches have kind of gone to this model that that Ben kind of established with me. Hey, you have these guys to monitor. So like if they're, you know, if their body weight, they're not hitting their body weight goal. Now the head coach comes to the head strength coach. Well, now the head strength coach comes to the assistant strength coach. So he's held accountable as well. Yeah. So I would advocate for that. I, I think, you know, it's something that is just kind of going to be the trend in, in college strength and conditioning. Is a college strength coach uh, an advocate for the athlete first or are they advocates for the team? Oh, explain that one a little bit. So if you're working <laughs> with athletes, is your first and primary focus is to look out for their well-being and then to convey that potentially to the position coaches because yeah. they might be able to articulate? Or do you have to look at, well, what's the best for the team in terms of the, the I want to say the business, but this, the organization right. aspect, or is it all mixed up? I think, I think you always have to put the team first. And what's nice about being a strength coach is you get to have those hard conversations with the kids. If, they, if they're not getting playing time or if they're not improving in a certain way um, or if they're not trusted by the staff, I think a lot of times the kids will come to the strength coach because we touch them so much yeah. and they feel that level of comfort. And so then the, the strength coach's job is to understand you know, what the mission of the program is so he can articulate it to the player. But then he can also, on the back end, um, in a in a very positive way, articulate to the coach, hey, you know, we have a guy that may be a little disgruntled, things like that. Um, but you should always have, in my opinion, the program is always the most important. That's the same with me at Sports Advantage. Mm -hmm. Sports Advantage takes priority over anything that I want, anything our owners want, anything our assistants want, you know, the the brand and the what we put out is always a top priority and it should always be in that setting. I think a lot of times, especially with the NIL stuff now, like these, some of these kids are kind of like, I want to look out for myself. I want to look out. And you're kind of losing the integrity of why you're actually there. Yeah. You're there to play the sport and to try and win games and hopefully win championships and, and get a degree. You know, So I think a lot of the culture around the sport is hurting that. And it become, it's becoming harder for strength coaches to actually be in that role like we used to be. I've got so many more questions on this section. Yeah. But I'm going to move on. But I want sure. to end in one. We can obviously hope this is the first of many conversations yeah. we'll have. What do you think is the one aspect 
of collegiate strength conditioning that budding strength coaches get wrong? Oh boy, that's a good one. Um, ooh. <laughs> I think, I think they still, I think a lot of strength coaches right now are more interested in a little bit more. I don't want to say a little bit more because I want to be really proficient in this. I think collegiate strength coaches, from what I see, are starting to get a little bit more interested in the what it looks like on social media versus what we're the work we're actually putting in. And I think that is fostered by NIL again and the recruiting and things like that. So and I also think the losing the ability to develop the kids, right? Everything doesn't have to be like a mat drill or something that's so hard and things like that. Your goal is to develop the kids to keep them on the field. And so I think, unfortunately, a lot of misconceptions come from what you see in a one minute Instagram video. And I, you know, that's one of the things that as a strength coach for me, I've gotten way better at. I'm like, I'm like looking at it like, what, what are they doing this for? Like, this looks stupid. But like, I'm watching one minute of a workout that could be a compilation of a whole week. And so I think just keeping the main thing the main thing has got to be the, still the priority. And it doesn't always have to be the hardest thing in the world to create toughness. There's other ways to create toughness mm -hmm. besides like crushing the kids on, on a lot of different activities. It was a hard one. Because <laughs> yeah, it, it's so deep. There's so many avenues to yeah. go down. Yeah. Um, another one is you've worked with incredible athletes all around, but some that are genetically went to the league and weren't just in it, like we're at the top of their game. Right. Did you spot that from the start? Like when you were working with, just say when um, JJ Watt, for instance, did sure. you just know, okay, there's something with him or did you see that evolve? No, and I, you know, I think, well, JJ was a transfer in too, so it was a little different. Yeah. Um, you know, you could see like, like a guy like Joe, when he came in, you knew he was gonna be special. You know, I mean, he'd our, like our team, like team, like conditioning stuff on Fridays and tennis shoes where everyone else was wearing cleats and he moved better than everybody else. So you're just like, this guy's built a little different. But I think what was so nice for me at Wisconsin is Wisconsin's a developmental program. So you're not, you know, you got Joe Thomas. We didn't have a lot of other guys like Joe Thomas. You had a, they had to be made yeah. into players and they had to make themselves into players. So they had to develop and very rarely did you see a guy like that. You're just like, he has it. I mean, all the qualities, 18 years old, he understands discipline, he trains hard, he does things technically correct, he's coachable, he goes to, he goes to school, he eats right, yeah. you know. Um, so that's something that really has to be fostered as a strength coach. And that was, just, I, to me, that was the best part of my job. I mean, a guy like Ricky Wagner came in at 265 pounds and was a tight end. And ends up being a starting left tackle and, and being a you know right tackle in the NFL for like eight years, you know. So the developmental process was the best part of it. So very rarely do you see a guy that you know is a, you're like whoa, yeah. you know he's he's got it, you know. So then you moved out I did. of transition out of that occupation into the private sector. Correct. What? warranted that move and then was that like now you're into the wild west of where the regulations <laughs> that may have been there are not there yeah what was that whole transition like so you know i was going through a divorce and we were going through a coaching change so it's two things you know gary anderson took over the program um, brett uh, left for arkansas took ben with him and i was going through a divorce through that whole season i have three boys of my own and really had to make the decision of, am I gonna stay at Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. Which was, you know, from a job standpoint, the best job I've ever had, because I don't consider sports advantage a job anymore. Um, or am I gonna look at, you know, being a father and and trying to create something that, you know, I can be present for my for my kids. And, you know, as the, mm -hmm. as the off season went on, I, it was just more and more evident that it just needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And, 
you know, I wanted more time with my kids. And at the point we were at, it wasn't going to happen. So I walked in and resigned. <laughs> I was just like, I'm going to, you know, and, you know, to the coaches, staff credit and some of the administrators just said, hang on, hold tight on this because it's like mid-March. Um, let's just kind of wait and see, see what we can do to try and work through it. And it was evident it wasn't going to happen. And so uh, on June 9th, I, I told the team it was one of the hardest uh, conversations I've ever had. Uh, a lot of 18 to 22 year olds crying i was in tears you know because i just loved those players and i i i still love them i mean i was in kurt phillips wedding you know and and other i've been invited to guys weddings and stuff like that and i just but i also knew that it was it was the right time for me to do something to be impactful you know because we talked about the the value of training for young athletes and that's what i did you know i, I walked away and you know i had started sports advantage on the side trained a couple kids on the side uh, but then I just expanded it, uh, moved into like a 2,700 square foot um, facility that was like <laughs> orange and and blue and and maroon and the the turf that was on the on the on the ground was like worse than any mini putt putt turf. It was horrible, <laughs> and started renting there and you know uh, decided I was going to just kind of expand it. So we expanded the space out and and that's when we started. How long did that decision make? Or sorry, sorry, take to make? To resign? Yeah. One phone call. One phone call when, when I was on the phone and um, knew that, you know, my placement of my kids wasn't going to take place. I walked in the next day. Yeah. It was, it was like, a, and I really had no clue what I was going to do. But at the end of the day, it was one of those things where, you know, to all the coaches out there, you, you know, if you have kids, like we all know this, like that is still your first responsibility. And some people get lost in that. And you, you don't have to in today's day and age, you know. And for me, it was one of those things. My kids were, you know, I had one in middle school and two in, in, in grade school. And there was just no feasible way for me to do it, yeah. you know. And I didn't want to – and I also didn't want to cheat the program because to me, not being available for everything was cheating the program. And mm -hmm. that's not how I do things. I'm 100 – I people that know me, I'm 100%, 100% of the time. If I'm doing something, I'm – all in yeah you know and so that's that was that decision did that transition in that time add to your ability as a coach yes it, it allowed me to take a step back and realize that there's no end all beat all in, in any any profession you do you know you can always look to to better yourself mm -hmm. and and things like that and and so for me that you know, you know, put my back against the wall. I'm yeah. like, okay, I got to provide for my kids. And right now I'm just running like two or three sessions a day. Um, at some point that's not going to be enough. Yeah. And so I think as coaches, those are the best scenarios to be in. You know, I, I mean, you got put in it. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? When you look at it, um, it, because you really, you learn who you are as a man and as a person, how you, are going to try and build something that is long standing and um, and just that you can provide for for your kids. When did you start implementing? Or sorry, when did you get introduced to Westside Barbell? I guess that's the, sure. the best way to start. So, like I said, after Joe's injury, that's when I really started, you know, yep. going outside of the um, what we were doing at Wisconsin, where we were kind of the end all beat all. And so, you know, there were videos, you know, and I, you know, you'd see, you know, some of the videos of Lou, you know, out in front of just the building. Hey, today we're gonna do, yeah. you know, we got you know Chuck Vogelpol in here, and they're you know, or Kenny Patterson, and they're doing you know dynamic squat. We got a lot, you know, and he would list off what they were, and I'm like, man, that's <laughs> kind of cool these guys are big you know and when i got to take over the o-line i'm like man i kind of look into this a little bit more you know and that's when i started implementing you know max effort days you know kind of bookends of the week and then dynamic in the middle of the week and when i was in wisconsin we only used chains so i did, i wasn't exposed to bands um until like four or five years ago you know at, at sports yeah. advantage we're like man we the the bands for us are a game changer with the young kids for many reasons but like we only used chains and we didn't box squat, we free squat. So everything was free squat. Um, everything, you know, from a dynamic effort standpoint was with chains. Um, we did use a couple different specialty bars, you know, like a duffalo bar, a safety squat bar, you know, but we didn't really implement them at the way that we do now yeah. in sports advantage. 
what is your understanding of the system and how have you interpreted it into your sure. business? So for us, like I said, we're an athletic performance based company. And to me, the system hits all of the needs for an athlete, right? You want to build absolute strength. And anybody on Twitter, on any social media platform that's telling you that absolute strength is not important for building an athlete, I would either unfollow them or seriously question what they're doing. Absolute strength is the foundation of everything. And we 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 do that with our seventh and eighth graders. We want them to get stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, our high school girls, we want them to get stronger. Because it it to me, it filters into everything else that the conjugate method is, right? Um, the stronger you get, the 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 more bumps your percentage in your dynamic effort days. So if I'm squatting 200 pounds and my dynamic effort day is 50% with 25% band tension or whatever tension you're using, okay, I'm using 100 pounds. And we all know that the dynamic, to me, the dynamic effort day too is the, is the game changer and separator mm-hmm. for athletes. And so if I'm looking at that as a measure of explosive power or how we're going to get more explosive, right, with the dynamic effort method, because I explain it to, you know, I don't go into all the equations. It's just like weight times speed is explosive power. Mm-hmm. That That's how I equate it. Okay. So now I'm squatting 100 pounds, you know, 24 reps, you know, at, you know, we're hoping 0.8 meters per second or, or right in there. And we mm-hmm. can talk tendo speeds because we go a little different. But now all of a sudden, if I can get my squat up to 300 pounds, now I'm moving 150 pounds with 25% band tension, which equates to 225 at the top. So now the tonnage that I'm moving is more in a shorter period of time. And if I'm moving it at the same speed or I'm adding weight, now I'm getting more explosive. And that's what all that's what all of our parents want. I want them to get more explosive and faster. Well, by bumping their absolute strength, okay, now you're bumping the dynamic effort work. And the other thing it does is it feeds into our reverse hyperweight. Our, you know, our, um, you know, our sled drags, things like that. The stronger kids have more weight on their sled drags. The stronger kids have more reps and weight on reverse hypers. We got a, we've got a, a high school girl that does three sets of thirty-five reps on the reverse hyper with three hundred fifteen pounds on it. <laughs> high school girl, um, and we could go down the, but it's just, but it's systematic too, and so the kids can see the improvement. Um, but again, that's how we utilize it. The absolute strength feeds into everything. And, you know, we use different bars, safety squat bars, all that other stuff. Um, but it's it's unequivocally the best way to train athletes. Mm-hmm. Unequivocally. Because you your job as a strength coach, first and foremost, like we've talked about, is injury prevention. Well, okay, if I can see a lift breakdown in a certain area, I can see where the areas of weaknesses are. And we talk to coaches all the time. We don't rep test. I hate rep testing. It's just so – it's just – I think it's stupid, right? Because like you're doing sets of three to five reps at a 90 plus percent to failure, right? You're not going to, one, you have a greater chance of getting hurt on rep two, three, and four, and five. And two, you're not going to see where the athlete breaks down because of weakness. You're going to see because of fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so if I can see you break down on your first rep, now I can understand where some of your auxiliaries should be. And if I'm talking to a parent 75 to 80 percent of our work is done in the auxiliary work or accessories well if i'm now looking at areas of weakness like 75 to 80 percent of our work is built off of preventing injuries and that's what my job is you know Mm -hmm. so we get them strong we try and get them more explosive and then we try and bulletproof them are you going to prevent all injuries no but you better damn well try and you better have a system in place that allows you to find the answers to where those injuries are occurring it's a big misconception in that the conjugate method is very specific and locked in when in fact it's the most open system to take advantage of. If you see a part of a system or part of a method or an exercise, you can easily rotate it in, rotate it out. Right. Um, and back to your saying, you're saying that absolute strength basically is how you determine the appropriate accessory work correct and it's objective because it's based on it's based on the kid do you have a process of onboarding a kid i think this is what people get misunderstood is you just don't take him 
Hell no, 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 no way. No but there's way. an onboarding yeah. process to oh, yeah. where you have checks and balances to where now you can get into this system. Right. So, I mean, we take a kid through a basic assessment. It's very basic, not, you know, not ultra thorough. Um, we're looking for their mobility. How do they move in their assessments? About a 30 minute assessment. Uh, we look at hamstring, shoulder mobility. Um, we look at can they squat or can't they squat with an overhead, you know, squat with a dowel with their heels elevated. Then we'll look at their ankle mobility because we know that the ankle and foot is a huge determinant in a lot of different things they do. And then we jump them. So we look at how explosive they are. And then when they come in, now they're in what we would call like a phase one. And really, I'm going to be honest with you, like some of our, a lot of our coaches have different ways that they onboard. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, whether it's a goblet squat, whether it is a body weight box squat. I mean, the first thing that we always teach the kids is you got to find out what your box height is. Because until you grow, like if you're growing, then we have to redo it. But your box height for us, unless we're going below parallel, is always going to be at that level. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we, we teach them how to find their box height. Then we teach them, you know, correct position, uh, body alignment, things like that. Um, same thing with the bench press and the deadlift. You know, we use kettlebells. We use dumbbells, teaching how to grip the bar. I mean, we go so basic. Sometimes it's like overkill. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, once we teach it, we don't have to reteach it. And so... The thing that's unique about that process is that we could have a seventh grader that transitions into pretty much what we would call like a full out. They're, uh, they're in the system. Mm -hmm. They're rotating exercises, things like that. And we could have a sophomore in high school that's still on the box with a, with a kettlebell because until they can squat properly mm -hmm. or until they can handle some decent dumbbells bench pressing, we don't put a bar in their hands. Because again, there's so much more time for growth. Right as a seventh grader, that's that's six years, mm -hmm. and we never allow our parents or our kids to be like, "Well, we want to go to the next level." Okay, you're seventh grade. That means you're going to be an eighth grader. Like, I'm not looking at you being a college athlete until you're probably a sophomore or junior. So that process is very thorough, but we don't hold kids back. Once they can do it, then we start progressing them. See, that's huge because that's one of the biggest miss understandings of the system that I know is that people will try to take either do a one-to-one -one replica which can't be done because West Side's West Side and Louis was Louis so you can't take that and you can't take the way he ran the gym you can take your interpretation aspects into it for sure but there was very little questions been asked well how do you ramp them up right like if you took a, a kid of just say eight nine ten eleven years old every aspect is different but they would take the main aspect and, well, it's not going to work. Well, of course it's not going to work if you've never done anything before in your life. Correct. Um, of course, box squats are not going to make sense if you've never squatted a day in your life. Right. Like, you have to get the foundations in. Uh, it doesn't mean you omit free squats. It doesn't mean that we omit free squats. We, right. We put them in and out. We just know where box squats have their value and why we should do them. Um, but I think that is a huge aspect to understand. And how did you arrive at that? I, I just think it's come from my, my background as a college strength coach co too, right? Is you have kids that come in the door and like you have four or five star recruits never picked up a weight in his life. We have to teach them. Yeah. And, you know, and then you have, you know, guys that have come in and have been training, you know, four or five years and either use conjugate or had different methods, but they could squat really well and bench press really well. Well, okay, they're, you know, they're good. The kids that were the biggest struggle are the kids that came from shitty programs and that weren't taught, you know, how to do things right. And, and you know, technical flaws all over the place yeah. and not squatting deep and, you know, loading everything up as much as they can. And so that is where we just, everybody goes through the process. And once they are like, okay, you can do this, then we progress them. Uh, if they can't do it, then we have to keep teaching them and keep working them and keep looking then at areas of weakness as well. So, okay, why can't they do that? You know, why can't they push their knees out? Why can't they sit to parallel without crashing to the box? You know, where are those areas of weakness? So then we have to like add those exercises in to try and strengthen them up so they can at some point do it. Because a good coach, you have to be able to progress them into the system that you want to do. But there's no timetable for the kids to do it. Do you want to do it quicker than, than, than longer? Obviously, right? Because I think that you have a system in place because that's where you get the most benefit. But you don't want to rush it. So there's that fine line of, is it too fast? Is it too short? Things like that. So every kid is different. And that's the best part about what we do. We get parents that come in and, you know, do you do sports specific training? Do you do, no, we do athlete specific training. We 
give the kids what they need as an athlete. That's identifying areas of weakness and getting them stronger. To me, that's how you should train. Like sports specific is playing catch with a baseball, is shooting a basketball, is throwing a football, kicking a soccer ball. Our job is to give these kids parameters that allow the sport coaches to, to have an easier job with mm-hmm. the kids they have. Because you're maximizing the opportunity for skill acquisition. Correct. Yeah, because the stronger they are, the faster they are, the harder they can practice. Yeah. So if we all work together in that concept, we're actually ma- we should be making sport coaches' jobs easier and athletic trainers' jobs easier if we're doing it the right way. Can we dig a little bit deeper into the dynamic effort method for yeah, you? Yeah. Because it's so interesting that this is a common theme when talking with coaches and that everything is outside of max effort days. They're diff- but dynamic effort days make or break. Correct. I have not met a coach in the system that has not said the same thing, which is so um, interesting. It makes sense why. And it applies to both in and out of season. Right. Um, you know, and like I heard Laura on, on one of the other, other podcasts, she's like, that's that's yep. the day. And, you know, I was very fortunate enough to, to have her come talk at one of our gyms to talk about this. And the dynamic effort method, especially the lower body day, and the upper body day is important too, but if you want to talk about replicating, if you can replicate like system awareness, like during a sport, mm-hmm. well, you're doing, you know, depending on how you program, we usually, are, you know, are two to three reps. Sometimes we'll go fives, but mostly we're in that two to three rep range, um, you know, nine to 12 sets, you know, with 20 to 30 seconds rest. Well, if I'm trying to sell this to a football coach, what's your drive look like? You know, you have one play and then you have 20 seconds rest and you have to do it again and you have to move as explosively as you can. But the dynamic effort day, the thing that I think gets overlooked with a lot of traditional, you know, periodization coaches, stuff like this, is if I take a 400 pound squatter and I'm going to try and do this right off the cuff here. If I take a 400 pound (laughs) squatter, and I'm using 50%, all right? And he's doing 12 sets of two or nine sets of three, okay? In that four to five minutes of work, okay? And with the band tension, now he's moving 300 pounds right at the top. With the the speed that you're looking for, okay? The, the speed component is so important with the dynamic effort method, right? You're not just trying to move, lift weights. You're trying to move it as fast as you can. Mm-hmm. So the speed component is probably the most important thing that argues why that's g- gaining more volume than straight linear periodization. So if I'm doing three sets of 10, or if I'm doing 10 sets of three, right? I know in those 10 sets of three, I'm taking a heavier load with the band and accommodating resistance and moving it faster than you can possibly think to do doing three sets of 10 with the same load. Because at that point, that seven, eight, nine, tenth rep, you we know you're struggling through that. But you gotta do it two more times just to get the same amount of tonnage. And that at the end of the day, that's what we're looking for. How much tonnage are you moving during a workout? Okay, um, and we use the same thing with Olympic lifts. That's why we do the dynamic effort versus Olympic lifts. There's no way you can do 24 doubles or, or 24 reps in an Olympic lift at 75% in four or five minutes at the speed that you want to move that Olympic lift at. Mm-hmm. And so the other part that also gets overlooked is that now you're also, you, there's a conditioning component to this. Like I remember Alec Ingle, the first day he did it, I mean, I, he, I didn't even know if he was going to get through the workout, you know, because he's like, holy smokes, oh, I got to do it again. Like I move it again. Yeah, you're up. Let's go 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, and then you had speed poles, right? So now you're taking that ground based movement of you know a starting position in most sports and now you're trying to move that bar as fast as you can so for you know a guy that moves you know can squat 400 pounds and can you know deadlift around 400 pounds you're going to be moving anywhere from 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight in eight to ten minutes show me another system that can provide that yeah at the at, at the speed that we're looking for which is sport speed yeah this is no way and then you add the hypers on. So what we do for reverse hypers is our kids are doing, you know, anywhere from three, if they're younger, to six times the load. And we add the squat and the deadlift. So 
you know, for some of our kids, they're doing, if that kid was in our weight room, he'd be doing 60,000 pounds of reverse hypers. Okay, because we feel, and I I, I want to make sure I get this right. I think Louie had said you're doing four times the 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 number in reverse hypers in a lot of the podcasts that I've that I listen to and documentation and stuff like that. We do six because mm -hmm. it's younger kids. So they need more development. They need more traction. They need all that stuff developed. We don't have any low back injuries in our gyms. We have very few hamstring injuries. You know, so now you're doing that and now that's like 20 minutes that you've gotten that done. I mean, and now you've moved 80,000 tons of weight in 20 minutes. And now you you do your banded leg curls. You know, you do your hip. You know, so we do something for the hips. And then if you want to add sled drags or sled pushes, now you've got an hour worth of work in that is unmatched. And that's why we don't like condition our kids with running. We don't have to. Mm -hmm. Rob Havenstein trained with me last summer. He did not do one gasser all summer. We varied his sled ring, uh, his sled drag. We did his sled pushes. That's his conditioning. And then our dynamic effort. And we do the same thing with the upper body, right? You're, you're doing the same thing with the upper body, just with different exercises. So that that is a difference maker for training athletes. It makes so much sense when you break it down and to reverse hypers and sleds. Yes. We, had, we have visitors come in and out and working with our group and we're trying to figure out we would warm up with sleds and their visitors come and they're dead. They're gassed. And we're like, so, okay, with <coughs> Mac here, we're really diving into accurate statistics. Like we have it basically down to, it takes 125% to move a sled on our ground because every surface is different. Right. That breaks um, inertia, keeps it going, and then it reduces by 75%. So you got 75% on the sled. And then we took the hyper volume and the sled volume. Well, between that, for two of our athletes, that's between 120 and 150,000 pounds of volume. Right. When they saw that, they were like, holy crap. Right. So then we talked to some of our football players and some of the people that have uh, moved on and went and like trained with other people. We still keep in contact. I'm sure you do. Like, yep. you, And they're like, why am I getting more prone to injury? And then you show to them the hundreds of thousands of pounds of sled work they're doing in the week that that is now gone. Because it's you just if you think I'm just pulling a sled, well, no, there's intent, there's a purpose to what you're doing, right? And the dynamic effort day is that one day of the week where it's at an all-time high. Absolutely, max effort. You might be between twenty to sixty thousand pounds dynamic effort um, for our fighters. It's combined upper and lower, so you can just imagine. Ooh. But I couldn't pick a better sport to combine upper and lower for just say MMA, right? And back to what you're saying, it's just true. It's just the objective data doesn't lie volume doesn't lie yep. and removing the sport specific aspect we're like hey we're just making you a better athlete there's no way that it doesn't work right what are some of the criticisms you've seen and how have you dispelled them working with schools i think you know one of the biggest things that we see is is talking about the box and I'm like, okay. And and I've seen it both ways. I've seen guys that can free squat better, and mm -hmm. I've seen guys that can box squat better. So it's athlete determinant, right? And you know, that is probably the biggest thing we get is like the box squat question. And it's really simple, right? Box squatting is static to dynamic. Mm -hmm. Name a sport that isn't. Na name a sport that isn't. You know, stealing a base, swinging a bat. Um, coming off the line of scrimmage, a swimmer in the pool, track, track, you know, out of the blocks. Everything in sport is static to dynamic. And that is always the biggest question we get. But once they see the kids start to be a little bit more explosive through like jump mat training or vertex or, or just, you know, carry over because, you know, we look at, okay, you know, there's got to be other data besides just the weight you're using as far as like, what, how is it carrying over? And so, you know, I can use one of our volleyball girls that trained with us during the during the volleyball season. She was a senior All-State player. Um, she came in 36 hours after her sectional or sectional final loss. She PR'd in her box squat. PR, up 15 pounds for where she was in the summer. A week later, she PR'd in her sumo deadlift, or no, her conventional deadlift, sorry. So that's nine days later. The same day she PR'd in her conventional deadlift, 
we do a five yard because our gyms uh, in Wisconsin we can't run outside with the snow, <laughs> so we have a five yard. We do a five yard excel and do a ten yard fly. Mm -hmm. um, she PR'd in that, and we did zero running. It was all strength work, um, you know, emphasis, dynamic effort, huge, right for the volleyball kids. Very little jumping. She also jumped the same height in her approach jump and her vertical that she did at the beginning of the year with very little jumping. So the people that say getting stronger doesn't help your speed, uh, we just proved it did, especially with a, a young athlete who was in a sport that's jumping all the time. And you can get stronger during the season. And that benefited her. So, you know, the system is, again, it, it, you have to learn it and you have to experiment with it. Mm -hmm. But it works in all in all phases, and I just think coaches need to be more open to just like the two or three minutes we we say this a lot to the two or three minutes they they see on clips on social media, like dive into it, learn about it, understand it, see that it's not just for power lifters and it's not just for fighters, um, it's for everybody. On the box squat, free squat. Yeah. Did you ever think when? these questions come up and you're talking with coaches of what does it matter because we're making athletes better their sport is not powerlifting so the free squat they're not getting analyzed they're not going to go to a meet and do a free squat right so why wouldn't you box squat now to there's a lot of people's interpretation of box squats out there where it's touch and go bouncing off the box yeah anything done incorrectly is dangerous correct but when they go, well, I prefer, well, free squats are way more of, or have a lot of advantage or you're getting more range of motion, all this. But if we're doing our job right with accessory work, mobility work, well, then it doesn't matter. Like a free squat, technically, I might be wrong, correct me if I am, but a box squat gives you more um, coaching points, more cues, more data than a free squat. And if you're worried about mobility, well, a free squat is not what you do to increase mobility, right. to increase that. And we get into this debate back and forth. And I'm like, well, we're not, if you're a power lifter, yeah, you have to free squat. It's your sport. Mm -hmm. Your sport is actually around a free squat. Right. It's around a bench and it's around a deadlift. Correct. That is, and if people get that confused when a power lifter is in the gym. That's the same as a, a boxer in a ring. That's the same as a track athlete on a track. Just because they come into the gym and they get to leave. Like that's a big difference. Right. A power lifter is coming in. If they had a power lifting gym here and a regular gym here, that would probably be easier for people to understand. And I right. think they forget about that. Do you ever think, am I wrong in that interpretation or what do you think? No, well, I think it, it comes down to, you know, very similar to like the, the back squat, front squat argument, you know, where you got, we don't back squat guys because it hurts their back. So we just front squat them. Well, <laughs> I mean, you just like, you just put yourself out there as like, I don't want to, I don't want to work on the deficiencies of my athletes. So I'm going to give them something easier because I'm too lazy. Yeah. You know, and it's the same thing with the box squat and the and the free squat. We do both. You know, you have to do both. You're developing different strengths. Um, and I think the box squat for us is the best tool because it's it's a great teaching tool. You know, um, we see kids as we box squat and box squat and box squat. We pull the box away and they can free squat a lot better than they could if they were just free training to free squat. Yeah. And so... Again, it really comes down to if you're going to question methods, you better have some education behind your question. Because, you know, when we do it, we understand why we're box squatting. And, you know, not only to me, I, and again, you talked about the touch and go. I mean, the box squat is probably one of the most bastardized exercises in strength and conditioning, right? You see people squatting high. Well, because the hip angle or the, the angle when they sprint. No, like you're trying to develop strength. You know what I mean? So to me, a squat that's a little bit deeper is going to be more important because you're going to create strength at a lower level and you're going to create more mobility in the athlete. I just, I, I don't understand all the arguments that people want to like make for their, their way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Maybe ask questions and and understand. Hey, there is more of a method to the madness than yeah. than just maxing out, and that's that's the other thing we get. Well, you're just maxing out. No, we're not. It's like <laughs> maxing out is completely different than max effort, you know. And it's based from a point of education. Correct. In that we haven't just learned one system, 
I'm sure you have read every book that I have read of every type of periodization because it's very important because there's something better out there. It's our job to know it. It's our job to implement it and test it and report about it. But a lot of the people who dispute are like, we're not saying our way is the only way. There's many other ways to train. Right. And when you get the pro athletes, a lot of them have, man, there's people out there who may have just used a BOSU ball and a rubber band and are at the top of their game. Like there's so many variations to this. <laughs> But everything we come from is analyzing and comparing to all other systems. Right. When people dispute it, they have one system against that. Like, I've never viewed strength and conditioning in that way. It's not our way versus your way. It's like, no. How do we reduce injury? How do we make them better? How do we make the position coaches, skill coaches way more efficient working with their athlete? And it's, it's all this adversarial stuff because, again, it gets clicks, it gets likes, it gets all this stuff. I get that. But behind the scenes... It continues on you're like it's so bizarre yeah it's like we could trade notes i would like to talk to people like you got a different philosophy well let, let's chat yeah. we have more in common than we do against outside of you're trying to sell something well i think it's you just show i don't know if the word is dogmented view of, of how you perceive stuff like the, you don't have a growth mindset like how are you going to get any better like you you can't use the same program year in year out there's just no way because yeah. you have different athletes. But if you're using the same stuff year in and year out and you don't have room to grow, um, like why are you coaching? You know, to me, the conjugate method is the most complex system that you can use, but it's also the most basic. It's complex for people that really don't want to dive into it mm -hmm. and understand how truly, truly specific it is to every kid. If, if you don't dive in, all you see are you know, box squats, bench presses, things like that. That's not all what it is. There's so many special exercises that go into it. There's so many preventative exercises that go into it. Um, but at the same time, once you learn the system and you really dive into understanding that you can still pull different parts of other things into it, you know, but once you understand what the system and how it works, it becomes like plug and play. You know, I saw this and this exercise, this athlete needs a little bit more of this. Um, and then the, the, the best part about that is that after three or four weeks, then you see a, something else creep up. So then you have to adjust. And I think a lot of times, quite honestly, the, the reason people don't use the system is because you constantly have to be on your game. Mm -hmm. You constantly have to be watching because you just can't give like person a corrective and be like, oh, in eight weeks, they'll be fine. Well, in eight weeks, they may have corrected that, but now something else pops up. And so that, that allows you to continually evaluate your athletes while they train. So you don't have to do like an evaluation every six weeks. I think, too, if you're an extroverted coach, you'll trend towards conjugate way more. Right. Because there's choice. But on the other side, that choice and the lack of, I would say, defined boundaries that you find in linear um, causes paralysis by analysis. Like, well, why the hell are you doing this? That, the, right. But that's the beauty of it, right? Once you, you figure out this, you can start to use exercises, not as exercises, but as tools. They're tools of the trade. I can pull in this tool to fix this. I can put, but then people have used exercises as crutches. I'm going to lean on this exercise and get everything off and just keep going because it's simple. Right. And that works to a certain point. And then it does. And then it goes backwards. Then you get injured. Right. And that's why there's a time and place for everything at a stage of an athlete's career, especially the younger they are. As you said, you can get away with a lot more in terms of you can get away with linear for a certain point because they're going to naturally get better because they're growing older. But why would you not want to start them off on the right path? Well, I guess my argument against linear periodization is, is I, I use the in-season model. Name a football player that after, you know, three or four weeks of training camp that wants to come in and do three sets of eight. <laughs> yeah. No no yeah. way. You know what I mean? And and with the conjugate method, you're constantly developing and, and maintaining you know, through through the hard like hard like camp is really hard to build strength. Mm -hmm. They're just you know what I mean, but you're trying to maintain as much strength as you can through mm -hmm. camp and then continue to build it through the season. Well, th th there's no athlete that after two to three weeks of training camp that wants to come in and do high volume multi joint exercises. None, you know, or they come off a winter break. You can always tell like in the high schools when the kids have done that because they're doing three sets of twelve and the next day they can't walk up and down the stairway. Well, now you've shot. They're shot for like the next four or five days. But if you've continued to create or keep, you know, a decent amount of volume in your program with your accessories and you continue to use max effort training, rotating exercises during the in season, um, they don't get fatigued, right? Because to me, 
the day that's harder for the athletes is a dynamic day, right? I mean, that that to me is hard. Like to me, I think anybody can hit it, come in and hit four or five singles. Mm-hmm. You know, you just you smash it and then you get out of it. And then you do a couple accessories in season, you get out. You know, the dynamic effort day, you have to really understand it in season um, to really program it to a high level. What I also like is the ability it gives for goal setting. Correct. You're teaching your athletes the ability of like, don't get too greedy because you're going to come back around. Like you have to, for max effort, have an optimal jump. Yep. Um, now you can achieve, you can start, I want to hit this goal. Well, here's your goal. Now we set a goal and then they've learned how to put in a process to achieve it and to move forward. Dynamic effort day is the one day here. It doesn't matter what the exercises are. They just know it's volume. Mm-hmm. And that's a mental challenge. They're like, okay. And now they're playing the game of, well, I never thought I'd have athletes like, can we add a thousand pounds more of volume per day? And you're like, oh, this is a very strange request. Right. But now they're understanding the importance of volume. And that's the um, the beauty of this, this system. And it's always evolving and it's, and it's open for interpretation. That's so important. You can make it work for your athletes and you have it within your own businesses. Every right. coach has their own interpretation of it based on the same foundation. Right. Which I don't know of any other system that allows for that variety. No, I, I don't either. Because like if, if everybody was doing the same thing at our gyms, like in January, you know, first week of two weeks of January, everybody would be doing tens, then everybody's doing eights and everybody's doing sixes and everybody like I, I kind of laugh a little bit when I see other gyms like talking about test week. Like how how do you do that within a private setting? You, you know what I mean? Like if you have multiple gyms and you're doing like a test week, like at the end well, I, I don't I don't I can't even like to me, I can't even fathom it because I'm so ingrained mm-hmm. in, in in using this method. Because really, you're constantly always testing mm-hmm. in, in certain in certain capacity. But if you're in a private setting, shouldn't you have kids flowing in and out? Like a couple of kids come in February. How are they ready to test in three weeks when the other kids are prepping for eight weeks? You know. And so, again, you're constantly evaluating. I really like what you said about the tools. You know what I mean? Instead of exercise, this is a tool for preventing injuries and getting stronger. And it just comes back to you have to educate yourself and you have to take a lot of pride in how your kids go about training. And if you're just throwing something on a grease board or if you're just throwing something on a piece of paper, you're disservicing your kids. And and you know, you're disserving using your adults or whoever else you train. And so if, if taking, you know, so-and-so's, the, whatever college program, I, I always laugh about that. Like people are like, well, oh, we're using, you know, Clemson's program from 2018. Well, it's 2023. I'm going to guess that they've made some changes in the four years. You know, you know what I mean? If you think that, that you're copying someone's program for five years ago is going to help your kids, you have two major misconceptions. One, you're assuming they haven't changed. And two, you're assuming you have the athletes they have in their weight room. And both of those are incorrect. I think we're at a good point to wrap up sure. because I think there's hours more content <laughs> I can, we can record. Um, we've touched on what is a strength coach, your introduction to strength coach, into the high school strength coach setting, the collegiate strength coach setting. We've got some good stuff there. Um, I'd like to wrap up with three questions unless there's any topics you want to bring no go ahead um what were the most significant mistakes or misunderstandings regarding training that you've made i think the biggest mistake that i made and that i learned is that you can't continue to get stronger in season um it is and again volume kills that in season right and and not understanding that that Athletes actually do want to feel strong during the season. You know, I know in that 2010 season, four of our five starting offensive linemen PR'd in the back squat week 11. Not, not, you know, 80% of what they did in July. Whatever they did in July, they did, you know, five to 10 pounds better. And I know we went wherever we played that week, we went and we ran the ball 36 out of 37 times. And we ran the ball right down the team's throat in the second half. Um, so kids want to get stronger. That was probably the biggest mistake that I made. I think secondary mistake as a strength coach is assuming everybody likes the weight room. You, you know what I mean? Everybody doesn't just love 
coming in and training. You know, I think in, in a scenario like here, right, where, you know, you have guys, the guys that do, but I think strength coaches need to understand that e even in a football setting, not every kid's going to love coming in and training. So you have to find ways to understand them as a person and then how what you're doing in the weight room or on the turf is going to benefit them in the long run. Can you reference one book that made a pivotal change to your coaching outlook? I can reference two. Okay. The first is the book of methods. Um, it just, you know, just from the different ways things are set up and things like that. Uh, I absolutely love that book. Um, just from an understanding of who I am as a person, knowledge and gaining knowledge is important. Every single person on my staff got the nine book Westside bundle this year for Christmas um, because I think it's invaluable. Um, the second book for me that's been very instrumental over the last year is a book called Twin Thieves by, by Steve Jones. Uh, Steve Jones is a coach at Kimberly High School. Um, and Twin Thieves is a book about fear of failure and fear of judgment. And I think as... As a coach, I think the second one is the one that we all fear. Like, what are our peers going to think about us? And it's overcoming the fear of failure because you're going to – failure is how you get success, right? You have to fail to learn. And if you don't learn, you know, learn from your failures, then you're always going to be a failure. Um, but also the fear of judgment. Strength and conditioning is a very judgmental profession. And it's getting worse and worse. People are on Twitter and, and, and Instagram picking apart everybody's jumps, everybody's lifts, things like that. Uh, you have to be really confident in who you are and what you stand for. And that book is an exceptional book for all coaches to read as far as leadership. The last question, what are you most proud of to date in your role as a strength coach? <laughs> oh, man. Um you know, for me as a coach, the, the thing I'm probably the most proud of is that I haven't run my kids out of my own gym yet. No. <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, quite honestly, for me as a strength coach, uh, the th I have probably two things. Well, the first one is my oldest son. I mean, he didn't have a lot of genetic gifts. Um, he wasn't, you know, really explosive, but um, training him in our gym, um, I'll, you know, and developing him and, and how teaching him the love for being in strength and conditioning, that it's going to guide him into being a better football player because he wasn't, you know, he, like I said, he wasn't very good. You know, he wasn't very explosive, but his work in the weight room allowed him, you know, to be, you know, the all city, you know, offensive lineman of the year to play in college, to be a first team all conference player and really his work in the weight room. And that's something I'm really proud of. And the second thing is just the relationships that I've built and the trust that I've built from people. I have three former players of mine that are now business partners of mine because the trust that I've built with them um, as a person and as their coach, like I said, I've been in guys' weddings. And so for me, I think that trust that I've built with my athletes is probably the thing outside of you know my son's success the thing i'm most proud of because it tells me that it's more than just how much weight they had on the bar it's more than just the money they made it's more than getting into the hall of fame it's more than winning super bowls it's um it's the trust that they had in me and the trust that i placed in them um, to be successful so those are probably the two most important things where can our listeners and viewers find out more about you and your businesses? So we have you know multiple uh, Sports Advantage Instagram sites. The best way to find those is just uh, at Sports Advantage. And then we have Wanakee, Beaver Dam, Oconomowoc, uh, and Verona right now. Uh, you'll see a lot of different things on our on our Instagram sites, things like that. You know, my Instagram site, I, don't, I couldn't even tell you what it is. It's like BrianBot23 or something like that. Um, but that's more like personal stuff. Um, but that's where you can find a lot of our business site, our, our business website, www.sportsadvantageedge.com is our website. And, you know, I just, like I said, I mean, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, you know, Westside Barbell and, and so many people that have trained here and have come out of here coaching have provided a vehicle for myself, my staff to provide opportunities for athletes and i i'm so grateful um to be here and so grateful just to you know be a part of anything that comes out of this gym well we appreciate you and all the coaches that have uh, been advocates for this training system and 
um, more so been advocates for the athletes they train and to produce more assets and um, outlooks for athletes. So, Brian, thank you for this. And Thanks, we'll Tom. chat again soon. Appreciate it.